it's only right by me, so that's why things may hopefully not get disorganized the way you do, because it's just one person. They're being supported by, I'm being supported by Revo, uh, Mark's uh, videoing this, or recording it, so it can be put on the web for later, it's super awesome. Um, Creative Commons, NC by distribution. <coughs> There should be four sheets. So, today's the first day. We're going to get you up and running with the microcontroller of very own, which has been bootloaded um, with an open source bootloader, written by Kevin Michal, who I know and love. You guys may not know. You may not think he's cool. He's a cool dude for the bootloader. Um, we talked about microcontrollers today, which come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, so I brought some with me. This one, passing around. Um, and we'll talk about what we do and some of the things that are in them. This, we'll start with work. And then we will, at the end of, towards the end of things, we will start to make our own. Okay, so how many of you have used the microcontroller already? How many of you have taken Poe? Okay, so mostly people who are older like me have taken Poe, and you got these awful microcontrollers in those two cases for the picks, and you had to use this like really weird program, and it probably didn't work very well, and there was lots of frustration involved. Nick is nodding his head, yes. They probably didn't explain anything. They probably just gave this black box and expected to work with it. That's very frustrating. So we'll try to avoid that since we're using sort of an abstract and simplified system. Um, to take these, pass them around, check them out. Um, so all those things, what, what all those boards have in common there is they have microcontrollers on them. And some of you know what they're good for, some of you don't know. I think they're great for everything. Basically, anytime you need a computer where you don't have one, or you can't have one because it's expensive, if you need a button push, or a thing move, or something recorded, or a data set, or data received, microcontrollers are a great option. They're good for robots, because they're small, and they're cheap. They're really cheap. They're like two bucks, three bucks. Um, and there are many different brands and sort of variations. Here's their website. Um, if you try to download their stuff, you have to like pass a security check, and free development tools are kind of bad. Uh, I haven't had fun using them. Anyways, um, they're not open source. They use a proprietary compiler. It makes it hard to mess with them. Um, so we'll skip them. We'll be using any of their products. And we'll look at Adel. their website, and they have a cool butterfly or something, but we'll be using their microcontrollers, um, we'll be using that Mega 328P, which is kind of a useful name, also some of the features, some of the memory capabilities, but worry about that. Um, 
They're like two or three bucks a pop, maybe four if you get four or five if you get an expensive one. Um, good for projects, definitely recommend them. And sort of an up and coming microcontroller is the Texas Instruments uh, MSP series, which is on that red board that's being passed around. The entire development board for those is five bucks. So that's like on par with what we're going to make today. Only you can get like a really nice PCB and like USB cable. And you don't have to make it yourself. So that's awesome. Let's see, back up those. So, programming microcontrollers. This is difficult, sometimes. There's sort of two components to this. Um, you need the software, and you need the hardware, right? Because microcontrollers sort of bridge the gap between the computer and the real world. Yeah, it's funny because it's like real world measurements. Um, it's, yeah, but I mean, you can't like, it's hard to put your computer up to a transistor or like a motor and tell like, your computer to make the motor go. But it's easy to do that with, you know, some sort of embedded hardware. Um, so, we'll do some of that today. Let's see, let's talk about programming then. Let's get a good issue. gets loaded onto the chip. Um, and so this looks like a bunch of nonsense to you, right? Because you're not a computer. Um, but all it says is it's a certain type of, of uh, memory transfer, right to address 0000. zero, zero, zero. Um, and then, you know, write this, and it's this type of file. That's all it means. 
And at the lowest level, these controllers do one thing. They read an instruction, and they say, the instruction says something like, get the memory from here, do a thing to it, and then either and report back. <coughs> that's all That's all that these do. But you get to program them at a higher level where you can maybe say, like, that memory address is called C. Compare the value of C to 3, and if they're the same, then, you know, blink an LED. So, this is the machine code. You can program this if you don't want to. The next step up to this is assembly, which is just like this, but with words. So you can say, like, uh, relative jump to line 10, or compare register A, register B. And then above that, there's C code, which abstracts away the assembly, um, which is nice because then you have to deal with it. Then you have to know C. Um, and on top of that, you have this thing called Arduino. What is an Arduino? Does anybody know? Yes. It is also a town of improper. Actually, people think, apparently, I've heard that Italian people think it's really silly that we call it, like, add Vino to the end of all these other Vino products. It just sounds stupid. Um, I imagine that it'd be like adding Pasadena to the end of all these products. It'd be like, this is the awesome Pasadena one. What? Um, okay, so the Vino, though, seriously, is an abstraction and a standardization of hardware and software that sort of floats on top of various different microcontrollers. So you have like ARM processors and um, there's another one. And you know even PICS can sort of run this Arduino software or not like Arduino PIC. Um, what it is is it's standardization and then abstraction. So it sort of standardizes the hardware so you only have to have sort of a USB cable you plug in. And you can use their IDE across all these different platforms. And it's also abstraction in that now you don't have to deal with like particular registers to tell them what to do, or tell the chip what to do. So now you can just sort of say like, pin three is output, and then pin three will be output. You don't have to worry about like, is that also an input pin sometimes, or uh, do I like have to reassign it dynamically or any of that stuff? So it's very nice. Um, so back to the data sheet. Uh, we can we'll take a look at some of the registers and some of the really important functions, those commonly used functions that my computer has. So this is a really good place to go to um, Important things to know, not this stuff so much. This is important, right? How big can your program be? Well, we had uh, AT Mega 328. So this is the data sheet. This one, this one, and this one. We have this one, so we have the least amount of memory. So we have 4 k um, Anyways, so that tells a little bit about how big it is. You know, will it lose all your data really fast? You know, it's pretty stable. How many times can you expect to read and write to the flash memory? Um, probably don't have to worry about that. They're pretty durable. Let's see, that's not important for now. So this, this is important stuff here. These things. Um, this tells you how many I.O. lines you have. So there are actual little pins that come out of the chip. You've probably seen them, the little legs. That's how you control the outside world from your, from your chip. That's how you talk to other microcontrollers. That's how you can tell transistors when to turn off and on. Turn on and off, relay is like, that's really important. You need to know how many you have because if you need six lines, but your chip only has five pins that you can use for input and output, then you need a bigger chip. Um, other important things, operating voltage. Most of these are either 5.5, 5 volts, or 3.3 volts. It's not super important. These are five. Um, this is important. So timer counters are really important for delaying things or counting things. So you imagine you have like a button and you want people to press it a whole bunch of times and count it, you could use a timer counter. Buttons also have something called debounce, which is like where you, when you hit it, it bounces a little bit, and so there's a noisy signal. But oftentimes, after you check the first button press, you want to turn the button off for a while, or to make that delay, you need to count 
of time so it doesn't go on forever and it doesn't not ever happen. So you use up instructions, so you can use up instructions or you can use one of these timers. Um, so those are APIC timers, uh, timer counters, and the same thing. Uh, so they construct a two day counts. This one can construct a two to the sixteenth. Um, let's see, PWM. Who knows what PWM is? You do. You do. You do. What is PWM? Car width module? Uh, close. Pulse width, pulse, width, <laughs> pulse width modulation. So we'll look at a little sample PWM here. Divided by the Google. Okay. <coughs> so this is from our unit website. I've seen this graph a lot. But it's really good. So if you look at um, all these different um, pulse bits, well, this, they have a period, right? So it's like from here to here. That's the that's the period of each pulse. A lot of the pulse. It's the period of each um, oscillation, right? And the tricky thing of pulse width uh, modulation is that it's they're not always like half on and half off like a sine wave. They're mostly not that way because that's who these useful things. Um, we'll get into this more with like the speed controller that we'll build later, the motors, but. Uh, it's good to be able to change how high and how low your signals for a certain amount of time. Do you know, know why? You do. The average of the power. Yeah, well, so the, it's the, like, kind of the average of the power. So, microcontrollers really only have two states for their pins for their outputs. Either on, 5 volts, or off at 0 volts. So imagine if you want to make your motor go kind of like really fast, you just give it 5 volts all the time. And if you want it to go slow, you give it zero volts all the time, right? Off. And if you want it to go like kind of in the middle of that, you would want it to be like maybe three volts. The microcontroller can't do that. So what you do is you average it out. So you would have um, what's like three over five. You have like a sixty percent, right? You want it going about sixty percent of the time. Um, but obviously, you wouldn't want to just like say, like, well, over the course of one minute. We're going to have it on for 60% of the time and off. Because then your motor will be on for 60% of the time really fast and then off. Um, that would be kind of no good. Because you just have it be going really fast. But it turns out if you do this fast enough, the motor can't react fast enough, it basically isn't sensitive enough to these changes. Um, because of capacitance, it sort of smooths it out. And it ends up being about 3 volts if you give it a 60% of the cycle. So there are two things you need to know for any to like characterize any pulse with blind <coughs> system or pulse train or whatever you want to call it. You need to know the duty cycle and the frequency. So the frequency tells you how how uh, frequently these pulses happen. So this one is maybe let's say it's one second. You can make it two seconds, it would be much wider. Or you can make it like half a second. Um, servos light pulse is about 20 milliseconds every 60, uh, about like 60 hertz I think. So you want a 60 hertz frequency, but the pulses would, would maybe be longer or shorter. Um, changing the pulse width changes how on it is. So like this one maybe is one volt, this one's about two volts, three volts, that one's five volts. Uh, questions about PWM? Let's see how it does the other way. Um, possible. 
turns out to be but so we'll, we'll scroll this thing down for a little bit and we'll see you guys have it. So, uh, so your counter produces this stuff. stuff. Yeah, listen. So your counter, right, sort of goes up over time. Right? And uh, you can compare this to other numbers. So what you do is there's a register. It's just a thing that sort of stores data. It's like, you know, it's like a variable. And it has a special name. It's probably called something like TCC. R zero and like hey if you want to make it let's call this one right here's your counter it's counting from hold on it's counting from one to one hundred we said TCCR zero which is the pair register maybe fifty <coughs> right and what that does is it tells them to, to turn on every time your counter gets to fifty so every time your counter gets to fifty um, this will be your like your output bit right. So here's your capture, it's going down, it's going up. Great. And so every time it gets to 50, it turns on. Um, and then at the end of the, you know, the cycle, it turns back off. And then again, so you wait here, it gets 50, it turns on. And that's how you get these sort of pulses. Um, that's how you do, so the real code for it would be something like, you set TCCR0, you set some other register to tell it that this pin is going to be the young pin. You don't have to do any of that, because there are going to be it away. So that's good. However, you can only have one frequency on our Arduinos, so if you want to do something other than uh, things like, and you only have so much resolution on uh, Arduino. So if you want to make your pulses longer or shorter, or have more fun, or have more control over exactly the voltage you the voltage that's coming out, you're going to have to sort of go beyond the but it's not too hard, just something to keep in mind. Know how it works. Um, yes. Go back so that was a uh, really important feature, really useful because it lets you kind of have an analog out from a digital device. So what's the opposite of that? Analog in into a digital device. This is another sort of confusing and difficult thing. Um, because if your microcontroller can only read 0 to 5, or 0 or 5, then how do you get 3.3 into it? This is important in the case where you have like a photoresistor, or really anything that will give you a varying voltage that you want to read. So if you want to make voltage here, or if you like have a sensor to get work. Um, but there's a similar sort of thing that happens. You can look at ABC. Okay. Again, y'all if you see I won't give you the keyboard. Um, so the previous chapter sort of thing is on the comparator, which just compares two voltages. Here we see here's our analog to digital converter. This is super important for obvious reasons. Um, these have 10 bit ADCs. Obviously, the more bits you have, the more information you can store, right? So some of them only have eight, to four, and what's two to the four? Two, eight, sixteen, two to the four. Like thirty-two. So if you had a four-bit ADC, you would have thirty-two values between zero and five. So that's not really great resolution. But maybe it's good enough for like having three different states, right? I don't know. Depends on your design. Um, these have like ten bit ADCs, so depending on your application that may be good enough. Um, the actual registers. So that's some description of how it works. Basically, the way this works is 